Hi everyone, I'm here with Kate today. We just had the long but now we're recording on camera. Hi, how are you? I'm great, I'm thank great, you. Thanks. Can you hear me well or we're still kind of breaking uh, up a bit? It, it keeps sort of crackling from time to time, but let's hopefully hopefully everyone can hear, hear awesome. me and you. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share your experience with us. Um, it's really awesome to have you here. Uh, you can tell us which cancer uh, did you have that would be awesome? Okay, so I was diagnosed um, in 2006. I was so I was 40 42 years old and it was uh, breast cancer and it was um, highly aggressive um, and uh, it, I needed treatment immediately basically so good. when you say highly aggressive do you mean was it already is that the type of cancer was it stage three had already spread to the lymph nodes or? Um, it had spread to my lymph nodes, um, so I think they call that stage two. Um, but it was the t it was incredibly rapidly growing. It was it was a very aggressive type. So, so was it? Uh, do you remember the type of it? Was it H? It was HER two positive. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, and uh, so what happened? Like, what uh, were you having? Like a routine? Mammogram or? I was actually on holiday in Italy with my family at the time. So my little girl was four, nearly five. My son was six and a half, whatever. And, um, and strangely enough, I had been, just before we, we boarded the plane, I'd been stung by a, a wasp. And when we got to Italy, my arm had sort of developed this rather nasty reaction to this wasp sting. And so I had to go to an Italian hospital and get it seen to, and they gave me these antibiotics and they said, don't go in the sun because if you go in the sun with these antibiotics, you'll have a reaction. And I thought, well, that's just brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it's great. You just, <laughs> just ride so right. on holiday and I'm told not to go in the sun. <laughs> it's really great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> So um, by the time I'd finished these antibiotics, I was desperate to get down to the pool and do a little bit of sunbathing. But I was really, really cautious. And so I lay, lay on my back with my front to the sun for about 10 minutes. And I thought, I better, I better turn over now, you know, like a good bit yeah. of meat on the barbecue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> turn myself over. And as I, as I lay front first down on the sunbed, I squished my boob into the cushion of the sunbed and I felt this, I felt this pinch. It just, it just was really, it just, this little pinch. So I, I thought it went, ow, and I kind of like got my hand and I sort of was pushing inside to try and find the source of the, of this sharp sort of pinch that I'd felt. And as I was prodding around, I, I felt deep within the tissue like a really hard lump oh, and it, it felt like a frozen pea yeah and it, i i couldn't move it around it wasn't nodularly it wasn't squishy it was a very hard and i felt sick as soon as i felt it i felt sick it just felt wrong i just thought what's that what's that something really rock hard like a, like a little stone or a little frozen pea and then the moment I felt that, I, I couldn't rest. I was very anxious. I, I said to my husband, can you feel it? What is it? I called my friend who was a nurse in the UK and she was saying, does it hurt? And I said, not really. She goes, well, that's a good sign. But of course we had another two weeks of holiday. Oh, wow. So I stayed there and I was just sick with worry. We yeah. got back to the UK and I went to see my GP and my GP was very casual and she just said, well, given your age, you know, you're 42, you're not that old, you're probably nothing, don't worry about it, go home. But, you know, if you're concerned, I'll fast track you and you can get seen in three weeks because that was on the NHS. And we went to stay with friends for the weekend and I was really So just upset. going back there, let me just 
So could the GP feel it? Yeah. And she didn't want to send you for a ultrasound or? No, bear in mind, this was 16 years ago. And, yeah. And I didn't know anybody that had cancer. No. And none of my friends had cancer. And I, I, I was still, although I was really worried, I, I, I still just thought, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. I listened to the doctor, but instinctively my gut was saying, you know, I was obviously worried about it. And so I'd spoken to this friend when we'd gone away for the weekend and I ended up like really crying and it was about three in the morning. And she said, well, have you got private health? And at the time we did, I, we don't now, but at the time we did because of my husband's job. And so I said, um, yeah. And she said, well, what are you waiting for? Just, just yeah. go and get yourself seen privately. And, and so I did. And, um, and I, I went to see the consultant and I had a scan and it was very, very obvious that something wasn't quite right because I had the scan. First of all, I saw the doctor and he said, no, probably nothing to worry about given your age. And then he said, but anyway, off you go and have your scan. And, and then the nurse started saying, well, we just need to take a few more images and, mm -hmm. and then all, oh, you know, come and look at this picture. And they said, it looks like there's, calcium and I said what do you mean calcium what's calcium you know I thought isn't that found in bones you know what's calcium yeah. doing in my breasts and and and, and, and I, I started asking questions and then I went back to see the consultant and there was a breast care nurse in the room with him and I thought well she wasn't there when I came in and yeah he started looking and he was shaking his head and he said uh I don't like the look of this and we could very well be looking at cancer here, but until we've got the results of the biopsy, which is another week, we can't be sure. And then I just went into kind of shock really. Did they do a, a needle aspiration then or did they? Yeah. Yes. yes. They did. Um, and then um, I had a week of to wait. Oh. That was yeah. the worst, worst, just not knowing worse. Oh, yeah really awful and you kind of hang on with that little bit of hope that it's going to come oh, back and it's not going to yeah. be cancer as well don't you and it's just like yeah. you know you drive, yourself mad. Out. You drive yeah. yourself mad with the the, the thoughts and i remember I, I i a friend had invited me down to dorset for a week and i thought i'm just gonna have to go because if i don't i'll go mad so yeah. i went and i remember really strange thoughts going through my head like she had young kids, I had my young kids, and we went for a walk and she said, let's take a picture. And I, I didn't want to be in the picture. Oh. I thought, no, because I'm not going to be here for much longer. Really, really scary stuff. Yeah. I know. You know what I mean. Yeah. It's, I was it's, in that place. Not, not, a good, it's not a good place to be. And if anyone's going through that right now, all I'd say is, don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry, because there's so much that can be done. Yes. And we, we survive. We yeah. survive. And don't give in to that fear. Just, just be, it just, just, just yeah. wait until you know. Exactly. And what, we'll know what you have for sure and what the plan is yeah. going to be, right? Exactly. Because the minute I got my diagnosis, although it was terrifying, it was then suddenly, it was like, they take over. And yeah. it's like, on Monday you're coming here and then you go and, and suddenly that was all manageable in a way because it was like we were doing something about it it's that it's that limbo when you don't know yeah that it's really it's oh you're just so yeah um, all over the place definitely yeah. so then you went back after a week and you saw the same consultant yeah I went back and he said it it is it is cancer and it's very aggressive and we want you on the operating table on Monday this was wow. Friday yeah and um i had a lumpectomy and then they did they took three lymph lymph nodes to see whether it had spread and the first lymph node was infected which mean me meant at the time i don't know whether they do this now but they did mm -hmm. it then and it's pretty horrendous you then go for what's called an auxiliary clearance when they they will take the rest of the lymph nodes from under your arm out to check every nodule because it can jump from if it's if it, the cancer's reached the first lymph node, then it can then jump from the first to the third, or the first to the yeah. seventh. It doesn't automatically go along. Oh, go in order. Okay. So they they then remove all the. I think now they could possibly scan, but they couldn't at the time. And that second operation, which was 
they remove the, the lymph nodes is a horrible operation because then you have to have a drain in your side for a week because all of the the lymph fluid has to be yeah. drained out and it's very painful because they you know they, they they cut through some nerves and i haven't got sensation under my arm um but um and that was so how they do they after so after that first lumpectomy and then yeah. they then they did the second, which was the the operation, which was the auxiliary clearance. It was quite quite soon after as well. Yeah. So I had the the lumpectomy. Then I had the lymph node operation, the auxiliary, auxiliary clearance. Then when they saw that it hadn't spread any further, then I had like full body body scans, and they saw it hadn't spread. But because of that one lymph node that had been infected, my oncologist wanted to throw the the whole kitchen sink at me and just blast me wow. because he said we're not leaving it to chance he said you're too young and we're going to give you eight cycles of chemo six weeks of radio a year of a drug called herceptin which is done intravenously oh, and, wow. and then tamoxifen five years so looking back now with everything i know would I have done it differently? I even asked my oncologist that very question because the chemo was not nice. No. Um, he said, it, Kate, it, yes. with, your, with how aggressive it was, we, had, we didn't want to take any chances. Yeah. And yes, there's all sorts of things you can do natural, you know, naturally inducing yeah. all the rest. But if you're given a diagnosis like that, and, you know, had I not found that lump myself, because he was shaking his head going, how on earth did you find this? Yeah, because it sounds, the, the way you described it, it sounds like wasn't that easy to find. I had to have a pre-op procedure because it was so deep within the tissue. And the pre-op procedure was basically, they would anesthetize it and they would have to go in and like, with a, like a little fishing to look one, and hook on a needle to the, tumor so that the surgeon when he went in could find it wow and that's how and the, the, the surgeon was literally shaking. he said how on earth did you find this well i would say and that b saved your life that that there was what well, saved my life yeah. it did wow incredible isn't it how life yeah happened. and i think you know like your kids were the same age as my kids so my kids were six and four it's a scary when you Very. receive diagnosis, yeah, when you receive a diagnosis, and I, and I, I, I'm totally with you. Like knowing what I know now, would I have done the twelve sessions of chemotherapy, which wasn't very nice at all? It's it's very very difficult to know the answer to that. It is, and you can get second opinions and third opinions, and everybody's got their view. But you have to listen to yourself mm. you because at the end of the day, you're the one going to be living with that decision yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, do There's, what is right. Do what is right for you, but get get some second and third opinions. And it's interesting because I've done a lot of research since, and I thought, oh, maybe I could have cured myself with juices. And yes, maybe I could. Who knows? But yeah, am I grateful? I'm here today to tell the story. Yes, of course I am. Yeah. So, you know, you can combine as well. You can do obviously juicing. I should have done a lot more than that. Uh, but I tried, you know, but sometimes you're so exhausted with the chemo, you just need a massive great yeah. cauliflower cheese yeah. <laughs> and also wine to get through it. You know, don't beat yourself up. You know, you're, yes. a, you're already, you're already traumatized, suffering. Just be kind to yourself. Definitely. Definitely. I struggled with that. I struggled being kind to myself. You know, I, sh I don't deserve to have a massage. I shouldn't be sitting around eating sandwiches, you know, doing nothing, you know, this constant, beating myself up and that was part of my journey to learn to be kinder yeah. to myself and yeah I, I feel that's a big part and I think it's it's good that you bring that up because I think so many people you know they focus on the juicy and they focus on the exercise yeah. and the physical which is kind of you know what you think it would be um you know the solution to this problem but I think it cancer is so complex that you really need to look at every aspect of your life and, oh, completely. and go at each one and start going through and cleaning each aspect of your life. 
in a way that works for you. Yeah. It's like you say you could, you could, you could, um, you know, be exercising religiously. You could be juicing every day. You could be doing your yoga meditation, but if inside deep down you're angry with someone, you have resentment, you've got trauma unhealed from any area of your life, you've got a toxic relationship that has to be that has to be dealt with and it's a it's 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 difficult work it's hard work because you have to go within and so often what we will do is we will feel uncomfortable we'll feel wobbly we'll feel these negative emotions coming up and we'll block it we'll think yeah. no i'll numb it it's much easier to numb it or have that bottle of wine or I'll binge on Netflix or I'll eat that tub of ice cream, whatever, just to, just to just not go then and just numb yeah. it. I don't want to talk about it. It's because it's pain. Yeah. That pain is the secret yeah. to your healing. Yeah. It's definitely where the root cause is, isn't it? It's just the root cause. Yes, definitely. So well, how did you like in back? So after, um, recovering from those surgeries, you had to start. Oh yeah, the oh, chemo. Yeah. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I was just very, very, very sick. I was very sensitive to it, and the minute I they started injecting me with this stuff, I was very, very ill. I, you know, I had to be hospitalised because I just kept, oh. you know, I was very being sick and had to be on a drip, and it yeah. was. And I would try everything before the sessions. I would take myself off for walks in the park and I would sort of talk to myself and it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. And each time <laughs> I just got sicker and sicker and I, it was not a nice, not a, I ended up losing my eyebrows, my nails, my eyelashes, my hair, everything. Wow. Um, it, and it, it just affects people in different ways. And I was just mm. unfortunate that it was not a pleasant journey. Um, so, you know, if you are going through that and you have to go through that, just do everything in your power to balance it with being kind to yourself, yeah. you know, good nutrition, but the odd treat as well. There's nothing wrong with the odd treat when you're going through something like that. Um, you know, massages, you know, laughter, laughter is so important. Yeah. Watch fun. I mean, I remember I was in on this after my second operation and I was on the third floor of this hospital and the third floor was where all, where all the cancer patients were. Yeah. Oh, my God. And because it was in a private hospital. I was isolated in my room and, you know, people were saying, oh, you're so lucky you got private. It's not always the best. You know, NHS, I'd have been in a ward with a whole lot of women and I got all men or whatever. And I could have had a laugh, you know, but I was isolated in this little room. And, um, and sometimes I'd see, you know, like a, a priest going into the room next door, giving the last rites. And I was like thinking, you know, I'm on the third floor. This is where people disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it was just awful. So I just would turn on the TV and, and the, there wasn't a great selection. I ended up watching Dad's Army. And all, I would just sit and laugh and laugh That's and awesome. laugh. It's funny. I would just sit and laugh. Yeah. Because it got, it got me through. You've got to do things that make you feel good about yourself. Good. Definitely. And laughter yeah. is incredibly important. I, I wish I had um, watched more comedies or watched more yeah. things to make me laugh. I think um, I was so into reading things about health and, you know, like the diet, yeah. you know that I didn't kind of allow myself to, and I didn't know much about the kind of how laughter can be a therapy and scientific. And I think it's so important. And, and if you've got, if you've got um, I mean, I was, I was really lucky because my mum, she, she would come, because my kids were young and, and my husband was working, I, my mum would come up for a week, the week I had chemo because I'd have to be hospitalised. She wow. would come up and she was like my, my chemo mate, you know, and she's 
great. So we would giggle together. And you know, when I was actually having the, the chemo, we'd be sitting there and we'd be going, oh my God, dodgy wig coming up on the right. You know, this wig can't be off. We would just, just, just joke about this, yeah. this surreal situation we found ourselves in. Yeah. Um, because you've got to get through it somehow and you've got to just do what you do what you need to do. And if that's, you know, having all your mates around and having a big party and watching yeah. comedy, do it. Definitely. How was it like to lose your hair? Um, it's, well, it's not an easy thing, is it? It's, it's not, not an easy thing. And I, and I remember thinking, I'm just going to be brave about it and I'm going to go and show my little boy who was like six. And I remember I was very upset the day it started coming out in clumps. And, and I said to my mum, just, let's just shave it off. So yeah. I kind of shaved it off and I went to shower and then I came down. And my little boy had just come home from school and he was sitting, he came in, and he, he was sort of seven and a half or whatever. And I said, guess what mummy's got to show you. And I went, ta-da! And I took took this wig off and, that, and I just, like my hat off, sorry, and I had this little bald head. It was the worst thing I could have done. Oh. The worst thing I could have done because his little face, he just went, and his little lip went and he started to cry. And I just, I, I thought, what have I done? I've traumatized this kid. <laughs> so, you know, like, just go gently, guys. You know, everyone says, oh, be brave and go out there. You know, they just do what you need to do. So I then, I love fashion. I love vintage. I went and got these yeah. scarves and hats and I became very glamorous. And I just didn't go bald. Yeah. Because I wanted to feel good about myself. Yes. So, I, you know, I would do these sort of like, you know, Audrey Hepburn kind of like scarves and big shades. And, oh, you know, cool. I, I would pencil my eyebr eyelashes yeah. eyebrows on in fact that half of that is pencil now you know still because my it eyebrows looks, never, it looks really, right. never really came back but but I actually found that I wanted to look my best mm. I wanted to there is this there is this um uh charity I think it's called look good feel better and they 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 will do makeovers and yes they do it here as well yeah and it, it that that helped me. I re I remember going one one time, and we had this lovely kind of session with other ladies, and we learned how to do makeup. And the funny thing was, I came out and had these bright red lips, and Mum <laughs> said to me, "You look like you've been eating strawberry jam." <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! Thanks, Mum. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> Thanks oh. yourself. Don't wear red lipstick. <laughs> oh God! But, but you I know, think you're right. I think it's um. It's not an easy thing. And I think I had a little bit more time because the chemo that I was on, I didn't lose the head from my hair from one day to another. Um, some people don't even lose all their hair with the back. Yeah, some people, and some people do this cold cap thing, but I couldn't do that. It was too. Cold. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember I told a lady at school and drop off, and I said, Oh, um, you know, I've got cancer and I'm just about to go through treatment. She said, Oh my God, are you going to lose your hair? And I looked at her and I said, I've kind of got different priorities. <laughs> yes, I might lose my hair. <laughs> and is just that, it's trying to survive here. <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it? Other people's reactions. Mm. Yeah, and because um, I had a pick line on my arm, you know, we had as well. But, um, did you have a port? A port? I had a porter cap, yeah, because I, my veins were too uh, small yeah. and they couldn't find them. So they put a little here in in this area here. They do a porter cap that goes underneath the skin, and yeah. um, that was a lifesaver for me because they didn't have to kind of go rooting around for the veins and uh, I know. they just I know. Put it through there. And that and it was hidden, you know. So yeah, the porter cap was really, really, really good. And um, so you had a chemo every three weeks or every two? Three weeks, yeah. Three weeks, yeah. I had eight, eight cycles. And then after that, you were supposed to have radiation. Then I had six weeks of radiotherapy, which, which was not nice because I have very pale skin and I burned a lot. Um, and, it's and it was tiring. every day, a little bit. They do every day. Yeah, right? it was, uh, yes, I think it was every day for, mm. for, for six weeks. So. You know, by the end of it, I was pretty, pretty burnt. And and how did you feel during chemotherapy? So you, you stayed a week in hospital and then you came home. 
Yeah, well, I just, you know, by the, by the time I'd had eight cycles, because, you know, I think on the NHS now, they won't even do above six. And so they'd literally finished me off. And, and I just, I, I was, you know, I couldn't get out of bed. I just yeah. was absolutely blasted. Yeah. And it took every sort of ounce of me to just get out of bed at that point. Um, but, you know, you do, you do it. Yeah. You do it. Definitely. Their body is amazing. And after my first chemotherapy, I was like, how can you have 12 sessions of this and the body is amazing? It's incredible. Yeah. Which is why we have to, we have to thank it. You know, you have to be grateful for your body and that it's got us to this point. And even, even now, I mean, as we're speaking, we're going through um, COVID-19. Yeah. We're all in isolation. But if you look at how nature has bounced back. Yes. You know, it's you know, very short you, amount of time. You're now, you're now seeing, you know, there's no smog over LA. You know, you're now seeing the, the, the Kilimanjaro mountains, you know, and the, the, yeah. um, the high, you know, in India, you've got, um, dolphins in Venice. I couldn't believe that bird song in Wuhan. You've got, yeah. you know, the sea's never been so blue. The spring, that springtime we've been witnessing. And it, it, nature bounces back and it's the same with our bodies. So we yeah. think, yeah, you know, we're being destroyed by poisons and everything, but our bodies are part of nature and they repair and they heal. And, and so all you're doing with, you know, during this unpleasant time of chemo and radio is you're, you're just getting rid of the, you're just stopping its tracks, but the healing comes. Yeah healing comes afterwards and so you and and during so just be constantly kind to yourself and eat clean and do your juices and 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 just be kind yeah. kind to yourself i think trusting the process right like taking each day as it comes and you know yeah. when i used to have a really bad day i used to say to myself tomorrow will be a better day yeah take you it know. a day by day that's all exactly. you can do exactly exactly so what would you say was the hardest thing that you you had to face or in your journey? Um, I think it, it was after it was all over, after the treatment was all over, um, and I was literally just shattered. And little by little, obviously, the support from the medical staff dissipates you're not seeing them as regularly uh your friends start you know getting back to normal life and your family you know go back to everything and, and you're just suddenly left absolutely shell-shocked and supposed to just get on with life yeah <laughs> you were so right it's the hardest time that's the worst and it's like yeah. oh, she's cured and she should be feeling bloody grateful <laughs> Lucky thing. Yeah, you're lucky to be alive, you are. <laughs> what are you feeling grateful? <laughs> oh, I can why she's weeping. Anyone that told me that I should be grateful, it's like, you tried going through that and feeling grateful. <laughs> <laughs> you were so right. It's exactly that, isn't it? There is this expectation. By the way, just go live a normal life. Be, by the way, be pleasant with, to everyone. Yeah, why don't you know? your kids from school? Why you have an afternoon, you lazy thing? <laughs> it's insane isn't it it's, yeah. it's, you were like you, you're right you're just like how how am I gonna go back to this normal life and you feel so just you feel you feel I mean there is such a thing as you know post-traumatic stress after after cancer and after treatment because you've got to you've got to grieve you and, and that's normal so if you are feeling like that it's yeah. it's completely normal. It's completely okay. Don't go beating up yourself about that. Yeah. Just, just and 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 it's nobody else's business what you do or how long you need. Yeah, I remember my uh, my uh, uh, I spoke to my GP. She's a lovely GP, and I said to her, it was getting towards the end of my treatment. I said, to her so how long does 
people uh, wait before they go back to work? And she said, Angelica, you've been through a lot. Yeah. You've got to give yourself a chance to heal. Mm. And I kind of asked to her, to, to, her, to her, like, but, like, if I don't go back to work, what would work she just me. She was in completely disbelief. Like, haven't you learned your lesson, kind of thing? You know, like she's like Angelica, you've been through a lot, and if you have, if you never went back to work, I think people will understand. And I went, okay, because it's because it was true. It was like it's such a a life changing event that you can't and just bounce back, bounce back. No, I- but, but also, you, I started just, I was like a dog with a bone. I had to find out why did I get it. Mm. I, I said, you know, that's really strange. You know, I don't have cancer in the family. Why, was I stressed? Yes, I was stressed. You know, why was I stressed? Why did I feel like, why were well, these? And, 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 and after I'd gone through this treatment, I still had this sort of feeling of, you know, not really being happy, not really searching for something. And I wasn't quite sure what it was. And, and I think at the end of the day, I, that's when the real work began because that's when I had to say, okay, so you obviously, you know, my life's out of balance. Mm. It's out of balance. Something's not right. You know, I'm not at ease. Uh, there is a dis-ease within yeah. me. And the cancer may have been burnt out or cut out or whatever, but the dis-ease is still yes. here. I've got to get to the bottom of this dis-ease. And I've got to do what it takes. You didn't and feel so, healed, right? You didn't feel yeah, like, I didn't feel yeah. at all. I felt this was the beginning of my journey. And this, yeah. I was asking questions, you know, and I looked into nutrition. I looked into, but actually for me, the biggest healing was the sort of spiritual healing. It was like going within and, and you know, sorting out my emotions and feelings that I had since childhood of not being good enough, not being worthy, you know, like, and, 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 and just think, you know, the worst thing I could have done or you could do right now is to, to race back into the world and be busy, be a busy fool and just carry on and then get burnt out again. And then you're sick again, but it'd be something else. Um, you know, we have, we have to deal, you know, it's, it, this, there's a global pandemic right now because there is a global dis-ease. Everybody's yeah. just, be busy, do stuff, you know, work harder, earn more money, no, no, no. That's not the solution. Yeah. We all actually have to slow down, mm. look within, take the time to see. You know, we don't, life can be simplified. Yeah. We need to sit back. We need to stop being so busy and being distracting ourselves from our dis-ease and yeah. deal, deal with the root cause, deal with what it is. And start to find things that make you happy, whether it's dancing or yoga or meditation or painting or creativity is really, really important. Yeah. Creativity is an expression of our soul's deepest desires. And we all have, we're all, in my humble opinion, we are all spiritual beings and we're having a human experience. Yeah. This and I think we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves, yeah. right? And I think that's where we are feeling so disconnected because yeah. you're just, you know, on this automatic pile of going to work, earning more money, buying your car, buying your house, buying your handbag, buying, you know, and you come back to ourselves and we're still unhappy. Yeah, you still feel empty because exactly. you're all you've, done is you've just got things externally. But if you're not working on your internal self your your true self if you look at little children they they epitomize joy happiness freedom that's who we ultimately are we're born in we're born as light souls of you know laughter happiness joy expressions of love and then life gets in the way and there's all this, well, you should go to work and you should become a multimillionaire and you should yeah. get a bigger house. Your children should get A grades and everything. And you, yeah. you know, all the external pressures of the should, should, shoulds. And we lose our essence. Yeah. We lose who... The connection to what, what we want to... Who we're designed who we to be. Yeah, who we really are. That disconnect, that dis-ease. That's why people have mental breakdowns. That's why people have burnout. That's why people get sick. Yeah. 
And I think that we, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, before we were recording, I, you know, I find that the people that I talk to, um, I also volunteer in a hospital in the cancer ward. And, uh, you know, when I talk to people about, you know, have you made any changes in your life, you know, you know, and have you, um, you know, you know, the things that they, they do themselves. And I find that very, a very small percentage of people want to do the emotional healing work. And yeah, they, talk, don't, they don't want to go there because it's painful. Yeah. And they'd rather block it out. They'd rather, oh, you know, these, these uneasy feelings come up, or, you know, whether it's anxiety or depression or whatever, or, or, or there's just something that's not right, they're off, and they think, oh, quick, binge on Netflix. I don't want to, I don't want to feel it. I, I want to block it out. Yeah. You know, and like and I said before, like before we record, it's, just, it's, it's hell. It's not easy. Mm -mm -mm. It's not no, easy. It's not easy to do the work, but if anyone's listening to this, please do the work. Yeah. I agree. Do the work. What would you say, like on that note, like what, you know, what would you say was the, the most positive thing that came out of, you know, well, I mean, well, I mean, it's still an ongoing process. I mean, I'm I'm 14 years on, and um, every day I'm learning something new about myself and learning yeah. to be uh, to be to just to love myself unconditionally, just accept who I am mm. and not strive this ridiculous, you know perfection or whatever that doesn't exist um and and i guess that we have to we have to learn to be present we have to learn to enjoy the moment because the past is the past you can't do anything about the past mm. the future hasn't happened yet we we are we are in the present yeah and what we are doing and thinking in the present is creating our future yeah so if you're not changing anything and you are doing and being and thinking in the present now, how you were before you got sick, what's your future going to look like? Yeah. It's going to be the same. So the changes you have to make are you have to look at what you're thinking. Your thoughts create feelings. Your yeah. feelings create emotions and emotions will create whatever. Yeah. They create your, your life, right? So if you're, if you're feeling, if you're feeling, if you're having, if you're thinking, you're really useless. You've never done anything with your life. You've never, you know, you're you're you you're, you're a failure. You're not you're not good you're enough. Not, not good enough. If you're thinking that, okay, that's going to create depression. Yeah, isn't it? You're not going to feel good about yourself if you're beating yourself up with your thoughts. So you're going to feel you're going to get depressed. Okay, you're going to feel crap about yourself. And if your immediate reaction is, well, I'll just go and sit in front of Netflix and eat a tub of haagen ice cream. Yeah. That's going to then make Great you feel more automatic. Yeah. Make you feel more depressed and you're on a downward spiral. So if you start to change your thoughts and you start to think, okay, I, I'm feeling these things. That's interesting. Why, why am I speaking like this to myself? Yeah. And what I say when I do some coaching with clients and things is I I will say if you saw a little girl and you saw and and you saw somebody say to that little girl, You're bloody useless and you're a you stupid little girl and mm -hmm. just give her a slap and you know if you if you see an adult treating a child like that, you you just go that that's just it. You you cannot treat that little girl like that. She's so precious. She's so beautiful. She's just just leave her. She's innocent. She's gorgeous. But you're effectively doing that to yourself yeah. with your negative thoughts. You're doing that to your inner child, the child that you know you you were when we were when we were little children were pure, innocent, beautiful. Okay, so if you're doing that to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're you're making you're 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 making your life now hell, aren't you? I know. So you've got to you've got to change you've got to change that that whole thought thought feeling loop. 
Yeah. And it takes a lot of work. Definitely. And I think for me, I mean, I can be quite a black and white person. It was very clear that whatever I did until I was 38 before cancer, it didn't work. Otherwise, I wouldn't have ended up with stage three bar cancer. Absolutely. I needed to change everything about my life. Yeah. Because, you know, like myself, I didn't have any family history. There was, you know, nobody no. in my family that. So I needed to find, I needed to, to change everything if I wanted to survive. You had to. You need to have a really good look at your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, your you know what. And you have to start asking, what do you want out of life? Yeah, it does give you that urgency, doesn't it? Like, what for you to start creating the life you want, as opposed to doing what and everybody the thing, else the thing wants. Is, ultimately, we're all here to serve others. You know, you get, you get a lot of joy from helping other people and serving other people. But we cannot serve others if we're not serving ourselves. Yeah. And there's that image that I will always get because it works for me every time is, you know, if a plane is crashing, the, the, the hostesses and the pilot will always say to the mothers, put the oh. oxygen mask on yourself first. And then you can help your children. And what we tend to do as women, as mothers, is we will, oh my God, put the oxygen mask on everyone else, everyone else all the kids, everyone else, and you forget yeah. yourself. You forget yourself. Yeah. And then you're, you're useless. You're useless. You can't yeah. help other people. And, and so if you're so busy trying to help everybody else and you're not taking care of yourself, you're doing, the, you're doing everything backwards. Yeah. Sometimes we, 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 especially as women as, as well, you know, and women become mothers, we were, sort of, we were brought up to, you know, not really think yeah. of ourselves, you know, yeah. look up after other people, especially if you're in a patriarchal yeah. society or, or upbringing, it was like, well, you know, you're there to serve other people. Yeah, and this is your job. Yourself. Don't think of yourself because that's selfish and, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, don't focus on yourself, that's vanity. You know, all of those sorts of things and it's not self care is is it's not vanity it's not wrong and it's not and when i say self care i don't mean you know go and have a surgery and a facelift and all of that it's it's am i actually being kind to myself today am i thinking nice things about myself am i treating myself with love and the compassion that i deserve yeah I think you're so right. And I, I was totally that mom that put the mask on mm -hmm. my kids and everybody else. And, and I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I'm not that mom anymore. Yeah, you know, I wake nice. up and, you know, at six o'clock every day, I do my meditation, my exercise, and my kids know not to yeah. come and ask me any questions. Right. You know, because this is my time. And if they come, I will tell them, you can mm -hmm. go now because this is my time. You know, because I, they need, I want them to realize that I'm also important. Absolutely. And, and that, you know, so they can learn how to look after themselves, the, the self care as well, right? When you start looking after yourself, people treat you differently as well. Yeah. They treat you with more respect and more love because you're leading by example. <laughs> yeah. If you were going, Oh no, you know, just come walk all over me and talk badly at me and you know, I'll just do everything for you and you can get then you're just you're gonna just become a doormat. Yeah. And you're just gonna be downtrodden victim all your life. The going back to that question, you know, what's this cancer journey taught me? It's taught me empowerment. Yeah. Actually. It's empowered me to take responsibility for my own happiness, my own health, my own journey. That's beautiful. And if all that's come out of it is that by me learning to be kinder to myself, I can go out into the world and be kinder to others from a place, from a full heart rather than an empty heart, um, a full tank rather than an empty tank. Nobody's good to anybody when they're burnt out, when they're harassed, when they're stressed, when they're depressed. Nobody's good for anybody. No. But 
if somewhere along the line you got mixed messaging growing up or you you you're feeling pressure from others to work harder or longer hours or whatever that's wrong you have to listen to yourself i always say to people if you have a disease whether it's mental physical it's it's a really exciting place because if you have a dis-ease, that's your internal alarm clock going off, going, uh-uh, there's an alert. I know. Something's not right. Pay attention. Yeah. Pay attention. Yeah. And, and Ken said it makes you pay attention because it's not a, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I'll really... need the harder lessons. You know, it's kind of like, they're not paying attention. We've had, the, these alerts have been going off, the red lights have been going off, right? So, they're not paying attention. Let's just do something to make them really pay attention. A bit more serious because clearly the volume is not up and up. We need to turn the volume up. <laughs> but you see, I, 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 when I say it's an ongoing journey for me, like these 14 years, you know, like it's, there's no way that I'm still, you know, do, I'm, I'm not doing everything perfectly. You know, I will still have days where, you know, I beat myself up or I yeah. eat the wrong things or I don't feel good about myself but but I they're less now yes it's not all the time and I've learned that oh that's interesting I've let stop notice well okay what do you need right now exactly. you need to go out into the park you need to be in nature you need to well you need to I need to go to my dance class I love my dance class it, it brings me alive you have to yeah. do things for yourself and then and then you come back to your family unit and you're filled up. You can yes. you can cook a nice dinner and be nice to everybody without yelling and screaming out. <laughs> exactly. So it's almost like you practice, you know, like we you practice new habits, then you? you're practicing yeah. new, you know, new. Um, we all are. All we are is a, is a series of habits. Yeah. All Definitely. And if our habits have got us into a bad place, well, then we can create new habits to get us into the right place. Exactly. It's as simple as that. It sounds really simple, doesn't it? but it takes it takes work it does yeah so my last question is what would you say to somebody who was like was diagnosed today with the same cancer as you um what would you with say the to same, that? with the same cancer as me well i think breast cancer because i i i did a lot of reading and i did i read a lot of louise hay you can heal your life yeah um and in her she she writes about how cancer in different parts of the body it represents yeah. different areas and breast is about self nurture it's about self love if your cancer's in your breast it's the fact that you're not loving yourself enough you're you're mm. busy you're you're just taking care of everybody else mm. um and not yourself is it and the I, same if if it's in the right breast and the left breast um, I, don't know. I don't know whether she writes about that. Because um, I know that she's very, very precise, isn't she? About she is. each part it of it. Yeah. Possibly is something. Mine was in my left breast. It possibly is yeah. something. Um, but the it crazy is thing is, the crazy thing is, is you think that by taking care of everyone else, in not taking care of yourself that you're you're being um you're being selfless you're being you know you're doing what you yeah. should you're actually being selfish yeah you're actually being selfish when you don't care take care of yourself yeah because the world is getting a really crappy version of you yes and you need you need to take you need to do whatever you need to do to fill yourself up to be the best version of yourself and then the world gets to enjoy you and you get to enjoy the world. Yeah. That's beautiful, yeah. That's so true. Mm. Thank you so much for your time. That's awesome. Um, I'm sure you're going to be inspiring lots of people to, uh, to look after themselves, to cultivate love and being cancer. Um, cancer, and you, cancer you're doing, you too, you're doing a great, great job. Great job. Yeah, I was just going to end up by saying that I am a wellness and lifestyle expert and I help people make tiny shifts in their lives that will come into massive impact. Amazing. Yeah, I saw on your little Facebook thing that two years ago 
you made that tiny incremental change just not to have sugar in your coffee yes and today so there is no processed it. sugar in the house no sugar, sugar it sugar is a toxin and it's highly addictive but so are negative thoughts yes negative thoughts are highly addictive we're more likely we've, we've let's like we've got velcros in our brain and anything negative will stick yeah. six times more than a positive so you, you can start by noticing that yeah, anything toxic is not going to make you feel good no and it, yeah i think the first um step to change is like i said just not just yeah yeah awesome thank you so much for your time it was uh, lovely uh, to have you mm -hmm. lovely to have had this conversation